lot of people forget that at least sales wise, and of course it's because of the breakup partially, but Bone sold more than NWA. Like people get yeah. it, people get it twisted. Bone was like on a sales side of things exclusively. They were like way bigger than NWA. Like yeah. Yeah. internationally bigger than NWA. Still yeah. are to this day. Bone yeah. is up there with, with Wu Tag as far as international startup. And uh man, they've had their ups and downs too, man. Big shout out to them. Uh all of them, all of them are very, very cool, man. Absolutely. I've got Especially it. Burner. Me and El Burner got some stories, boy. <laughs> yeah, man, it's all good. Yeah, I've got to spend the time with uh other than Wish, a lot of them over the years. So Wish I've only met here and there and but the rest of them I've had a lot of good experiences with uh individually wow. and collectively. Funny you said that because Wish and I really didn't interact too much either. But everybody else, you know, man, me and Crazy, uh, matter of fact, he interviewed Quick and I on his show uh, back in 2014. And okay. me and L. Burner used to just be backstage doing crazy stuff, various shows and venues. And uh, Flesh, man, we sat up in a hotel room for one concert and just just talked about life all night, you know. So it's like, man, all of them, man, were, man, they great bunch of dudes, man. Well, it's funny you say that too, because I've been on the road and, you know, lightweight toured with a lot of dudes over the years. And like, yeah, a lot of the fun, crazy girl stuff happens, but there's also those days where you just go back to the hotel and you'll talk to three or four in the morning about life. Yeah. You know, that happens too. You know, it's not- That's every, exactly what we do. Yeah, every night is not cracking like that. Yeah, well, it was for El Burner because he'd be he's like, come on, Tweed. Like, no, nah, man, we, man, we just chopping it up for tonight. But yeah, man. Uh, he's a deep dude. A lot of people, I don't know if they really know that, but he's a very, very, very deep dude. If you sit, sit down and chop it up with him, you might leave mesmerized. You know, he has a lot to say. He has yeah. a lot to say. Yeah, we've had... Uh, I imagine some similar or at least related conversations like it sounds like you guys have too. So, you know, that's like I was saying earlier, that's one of the things I think is important is that people understand the intelligence and perspective and the point of view of the artists that we love because it's not just about music. This comes from a place. It comes from a place of intelligence and wordplay and innovation. And that's why you know, we got to celebrate the music. So anyway, so with the, uh, with Pay the Cost, I had a uh, player ham on and he was saying originally you weren't involved with the deal or something to that effect. So what, what was happening on the business side when Pay the Cost was getting to priority? Well, that was the initial plan. We wanted to follow the, bl the blueprint of uh, a PE, so to speak, how, Chuck D and Flavor could do a song together collectively as Public Enemy, but then uh, Flav could have a solo project. So we, we I didn't want to sign it first. I figured, okay, I'll do the Penthouse album, then I can get a solo deal, I can do a solo album, and then the, uh, we could come back again and do another Penthouse album, but we all would be able to spread the hustle, feel me, so to speak. If you notice on the Bank the Cost album, I only have two solo songs and I've sprinkled in the intro, the outro. I'm sprinkled here and there, a hook here and there. That was all done on purpose. I just wanted to be an introduction for me to, to get a solo career. I always wanted to be the Morris Day of rap. So that's where my head was at. I wanted to be the Morris Day of rap mixed with a little Johnny Guitar Watson. You know, that's that's how I, I can categorize what, where my head was and what I wanted my style to be. So I figured, okay, if Flavor can get a solo deal, we should be able to do that as well. And the powers that be came in after the album was done. Basically, now they're coming at me talking about you have to sign this. And I'm like, why? I, you know, I'm just, I'm just a guest. I don't want, you know, I am signed. You already got your project. I just happen to be on it. You know, I want my own deal. 
So they admitted me to the concert, so maybe officially a penthouse player. So now I can't really do a solo album unless I go through the hoops and, and bounds and barriers of what it is, because now <clears throat> I'm on Rufus Records. So it was a trip, man. But that comes from us being naive to the game and not having really the right people to say, no, don't sign that, because then they'll lose money. Like, if you don't put it out, it's on you. Uh, I shouldn't have never signed it. I actually shouldn't have signed it. But I think if I don't sign it, then I'm holding up everybody else's career. I don't want to be the bad guy, work too hard for it to end. And we're sitting, you know, with Brian Turner. And was, oh, man, it was uh, almost felt like I had a gun in my head, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? I want to do the right thing for everybody, including myself. But I wish I would have had a high power attorney like Johnny Cochran or somebody back in the day, and then I would have been destroyed. So, yeah, man, you, you live and learn. Well, this leads me to a bunch of questions, but uh, one is why should, why do you feel you shouldn't have signed it? Because uh, I had leverage that I didn't even know I didn't realize I had. They already had me on the album. So if I decide to boycott, what y'all going to do then? You're going to scratch the whole album? You already paid for it. Feel me? I had more leverage than I even thought I had. I could say, well, I'll sign that, but I need for you to give me uh, a solo deal right now. And I'll sign this when you present this. Feel me? I had leverage. Just didn't understand the power of the leverage that I had. And I had nobody to represent me. And if you represent yourself, you have a fool for a client. So, valuable lesson, right? Gotcha. Well, we'll circle back to that point in a minute, but I want to get the Morris Day and Johnny Guitar Watson because that's interesting uh, combination there. What did you want to uh, mimic or recreate or draw from them for yourself? Well, Johnny Guitar Watson was was my was my my pet player idol. I love his style. I love his music. His attitude. His his his, his dynamic presence. And the same with Morris Day. He was the coolest guy that I knew. I mean, for my dress, his attitude and his his candor and his and you seen Purple Rain after the show. I walked down the hallway and, and asked Prince, "How's your family?" Just just crazy dude, but I always felt as if I was a combination of both of them. I've always felt that that that's what Tweed Cadillac is. If if you can. Describe Tweet Cadillac. He's a combination of Morris Day and Johnny Guitar Watts. And and why? How and why did you get the name? Oh well, that was funny. Uh, wow, wow. Uh, okay, let me tell you that story. I wanted a cool, clever name, right? So as I thought about it, I said, "Wow, why do rock stars have?" two of the same names. I, thought, I found that to be intriguing. It was like Rick James and Elton John. And I couldn't, I was like trying to figure out, you know, the, the, they both had a ring to it, but they were two first names. So as I'm thinking about it, I said, what's synonymous with black people? Cadillacs, everybody I know one of Cadillacs. Except Cadillac, okay. I happened to have been wearing on some, some tweed slacks that day, and I said, Tweed Cadillac. Then I said it again, Tweed Cadillac. And then I said, Tweed Cadillac, baby. And that was it. That was it. That was my moniker. That was my name. And I ran with it as far as I could run with it. That was it. That's how I came about. Okay. And with Morris Day in particular, uh, he always, you know, was suited and booted, dressed super sharp. And of course, there's the perception again with rap that everything is street and hood and rough around the edges. So why? I know bringing the player thing is one thing, but the importance for you of 
looking sharp all the time and, and you know dressing up why did that carry over into the career and why was that so important because it was synonymous with who we were to begin with from way back in the 80s when we used to go to the clubs we were sharp as the broke dick dogs they used to say everywhere we went we were sharp we prided ourselves in having the flyest footwear the flyest hats the flyest suits so it was like to put me in something other than that, it wouldn't have been me. Feel me? Because we was in clubs three, four nights a week back in the day. This is way before rap. I mean, we was, man, we was out there. The, the Hollywood club scene knew us well. They knew us well. So I had to be suited and booted. That's what we was about. I had to be. And tied into that, though, I always thought it was interesting that you know people like mainly big daddy kane but like heavy d wore suits at times big daddy kane did and of course especially kane caught a lot of flack for that so why did you guys believe that it wouldn't affect you guys at all because we had we, man it was the it was the attitude it's like you can you can put a sucker in a ten thousand dollar suit and he'll look like a sucker you could put a player in a $3 suit from the Goodwill and he'll wear that suit like it's a $10,000 suit. That's the difference. And we didn't dance. We're not going to be Big Daddy Kane dancing. We wasn't about that. We was Johnny Guitar Watson and Morris Day, baby. You feel me? That's what it was about. <laughs> okay. Makes sense. So then with uh, Pay the Cost, I was curious as to why you weren't on it more, but the other thing about it was since it had such appeal, when you guys would go to do shows, unfortunately I didn't get to see you guys perform in that era, but what what was it like on the road as far as how you performed and how you guys balanced that? Uh, it was fun. I actually, uh, I wrote a journal. I was having so much fun every night. I would write down the experiences and and couldn't hardly sleep at night sometimes you know after you do a show especially a major show and back then it was arenas and it was like man you'd be so wound up it's it's hard to decompress you feel me and then next thing you know we're on the bus sleeping and you wake up in another city to do it all over again so man it was like being at Disneyland for for three months in a row you, you feel me every day you're you're at it feels like you're at disneyland i loved everything about the world some people said oh, i can't stand to be on tour i hate it i don't i don't like the food or i'm constipated or you know <laughs> i can't sleep in various hotel rooms i loved everything about it just to be able to see new places because we're in south central la it ain't too much you could do or see feel me uh, so to be in another city, another state, it was just, wow, the world is big. This is what life is. I love it. Never want to even come home. 